into the box and we have things going out of the box. And uh, it's just sort of a convenient way of um, formalizing our understanding of what's going on. So here we've got um, a box that's just the ocean. And here we have our um, elements coming into the box from river water. And then we also have now, um, we've added elements leaving the box through some removal process, which we won't really name right now, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so you can, so here we've got the stuff coming in, which is um, uh, the, the water flow from the rivers times the concentration of the elements in the rivers. So that would be like liters of water per year times the uh, grams, the concentration of your element in the river water, so grams per liter. So we have a certain number of grams of each element coming into the ocean per year. And then, um, then we have the volume of the ocean, this term here, V. And then we have a mean concentration of our elements in the ocean, again in grams per liter. Um, so we can formalize this. Uh, we're interested in the amount of the elements in the ocean, how they're changing over time. Um, so you can just write that out here. So the, the rate of change of the, the total amount of an element in the ocean is equal to the amount coming in minus the amount going out. <laughs> so it's just sort of like a bank account. The amount that we've got, the rate of change of the amount in the ocean is just equal to the amount coming in minus the, the loss rate. Oops. Um, Okay, so we want to basically just want to solve this equation. What we're really interested in, in interested in is the concentration of our elements in the ocean. That's what we're trying to work out. So to sort of solve this equation, we'll do two things. First, we're going to um, we need to say something about the removal rate. Um, what is that? So it's not very really useful just to say that there's a removal term. Um, and we'll make a really simple assumption, which is to say that the rate of removal of an element is proportional to how much is there in the ocean. So that's what we call a first order process. So we just say that the removal rate is proportional to the concentration of the element in the ocean. Uh, and the proportionality is this, this K term, which we call the removal rate constant. So that has units of inverse years. So that's pretty much the simplest way that we could kind of describe in mass um, how this removal is happening. Um, so the other thing we're going to do is assume that um, that actually the concentrations of the elements in the ocean are not changing through time, that they're basically at a steady state and constant. So that makes this quite simple, that, that this um, rate of change is going to be equal to zero. So, um, So we've got, yeah, we have that the, um, the left hand side is zero now. So that's equal to our river flow in the water times the concentrations in the river. And then we've said that our removal term is the, um, we have to multiply by the whole ocean concentration because we're looking at the whole ocean. Okay, so that's, um, that's what we've written there. So since we're interested in solving for the concentrations of the rivers, concentration of the elements in the river water, just move these guys over to the other side. And then we'll just divide by everything other than the ocean concentrations. And that leaves our ocean concentrations over here. And we've got our river flow our river concentrations, and we'll divide by 1 over k. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So that's this equation over here, is what I've got over here. So here we've just solved for the concentration of our elements in the ocean. And um, what the reason I've done this is that it, it highlights this term here, which is 1 over the removal rate constant. So that has units of um, inverse um, sorry, of, um, well, the removal rate constant is inverse years, so 1 over the removal rate constant has units of years. And this um, quantity is, is really important quantity in chemical oceanography. It's called the residence time. So the inverse of the rate constant 
uh, the removal rate constant is in units of years, and that's known as the residence time. So each unit, uh, each element has its um, characteristic residence time, and um, it's basically the inverse of the removal rate constant. And it's a really important concept. It kind of tells it tells you how how long an element will typically hang around in the ocean between um, entering the ocean through river flow and be remo being removed from the ocean through a number of different removal processes. So it's kind of like a characteristic signature of an element. It tells you a lot about the behavior of the element, that particular element in the ocean. Um, yeah, so here it is again, the resonance time. So it's one over the removal rate constant. It's equal to the ratio between um, the concentration, the total amount of the element in the ocean and its um, input from rivers which at steady state should be equal to its, its output term. So it's the total amount divided by um, the input or output rate. Um, so again, it's the average time spent in the ocean for a given element with respect to addition by rivers and removal by reaction process R. And it's the ratio between the ocean inventory and the input or output rate. So again, think about your, your bank account. It's kind of the average length of time that your money hangs around the bank account between when you put it in and take it out. Um, <laughs> so elements, basically elements that have a really long residence time, um, so let's go back here. The elements that have really, really long residence times, like these guys have sort of million year residence times, so I'll show you in a second. Um, they are around long enough in the ocean that they get completely mixed by ocean circulation. So they have very um, uniform distributions. That's basically why these elements, um, they're very unreactive. They have, so they're completely mixed by ocean circulation. That's why they have very um, uniform distributions. Other elements are removed really rapidly by seawater. They're taken up by organisms or they stick to particles or they're, they're just what we call reactive in the ocean. And they get removed really quickly. They have very short resonance times. So those would be um, like all these elements. And because they have short resonance times, they kind of, um, the processes that are removing the elements and adding them, they have time to act um, that they, they act faster than ocean circulation can redistribute and homogenize those elements. So you tend to see big differences um, in different parts of the ocean for those more reactive elements with the short residence times. So, okay, so here's the table. Uh, this is just the partial table in the textbook. You can see a whole table of these elements. So here you've got um, some, some of the elements uh, their ocean concentrations, the river dissolved concentrations, and then um, the residence time. So you can see um, for some of the major ions, um, chlorine, magnesium, they have you know, many tens of thousands of years residence time. So they are really sticking around for a long time in the ocean before removal processes are, are taking them out. Others, um, like iron, has a very short residence time. It's only in the ocean about 40 years before it's removed, and that's really why it's such um, a limiting nutrient, because it has really strong removal processes and um, a very short residence time. So it doesn't have time to kind of accumulate in the ocean to an extent. Um, another important point about the residence time um, relates to perturbation. So elements that have a really long residence time, if you um, perturb their um, their input or their output term, say through climate change or something, if it has a long residence time, it's going to take a long time to kind of reach, come back to a new equilibrium. And um, elements that have a short residence time, their um, sort of average concentration in the ocean can be perturbed relatively quickly and they'll um, approach the new equilibrium relatively quickly. So, um, for example, we're not going to see um, over sort of 100. <laughs> um, 100 year time scales, you're not going to see changes in the sodium concentration in the ocean because it has such a long resonance time, it just doesn't respond that quickly. Um, but for iron, you know, if you tweak the um, dust input to the oceans, you might conceivably see, um, you know, over the 100 year time scales, you could see changes in the mean iron concentration because it has a relatively short resonance time. So the resonance time kind of gives you an idea of how you might change things and how the at chemistry of the ocean, which what time scales it might change in response to external forces. Uh, okay, so here, this where we are. Yes, so here's um, another figure from the, the textbook. You can see it a lot better in the textbook. But the, here's all the elements um, sort of organized in the periodic table, and um, 
what's plotted here is their mean concentration, mean sort of profiles in the ocean. So every little box here is a concentration on the x-axis, and then the y-axis is meant to be um, the full ocean depth. Sorry. Could you put that oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank I think you. Thank you very much. You'll be able to. Um, I'll just keep pointing over here, though. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So each. So the y-axis here is the ocean depth. So it goes from zero to what five kilometers. Um, so yeah, these are sort of average profiles in the ocean, and the shape of an element's profile in the ocean can tell you a lot about its um, behavior in the ocean. So I just want to highlight a few elements here. Um, so here, these guys, potassium and calcium, you notice that they have um, very boring profiles. It's just a straight up and down line. Um, that's because these are these really long-lived um, elements in the ocean. They have very long resonance times, you know, millions of years. And these are what we call conservative elements. So the reason they have a straight up and down profile is because they've been completely homogenized in the ocean. And their concentration is just the same everywhere in the oceans. So those are the conservative elements. And you can see other, other examples of them up here. Um, another class of elements um, highlighted here, there's actually not very many of these, but aluminum and lead. See, they have a profile where it's actually higher in surface waters and then decreases in um, deep water. So these are very reactive elements that would have very short resonance times. And does anyone have any idea why they might be higher in surface waters than deep waters? Dust. Dust, yeah. So these are elements that are input to the ocean at the surface, mostly actually from dust. And um, then they, they, these are elements that actually get removed really rapidly on particles. They stick to particles, and kind of the particles send them to the deep sea. And so they, um, after they're in the surface, they're basically quickly removed by particles. It's called scavenging. And they're not used by the biology of the surface. So they kind of accumulate in the surface waters. Those are pretty rare. There's not very many examples of those elements. Another important category are the nutrient elements that Pete talked about yesterday, so like nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, they are used, they're nutrients for organisms, so they're used by the biology in the surface waters where there's sunlight. So they have very low concentrations in surface waters. And then as the biology sinks out of the sunlit area and um, remineralization takes over, those elements get re returned to the dissolved base, so you see their concentrations increase with depth. So there's heaps of elements that look like that. If you have a look at the periodic table here, there's lots of elements that have that shape. Um, one interesting thing about the ocean chemistry, though, is that a lot of elements that you might not think of as um, biology sort of playing a role in, a lot of elements have these kind of nutrient, we call these nutrient-like profiles. So for example, um, silver, not something you think of biology as really using very much of, or uh, barium, um, a lot of these rare earths, they, they all, a lot of elements, it's very common for them to show this sort of biological-like um, profile. And that's, um, that's really reflecting the fact that biological particles, um, well, a lot, of, a lot of these elements will basically stick to the biology. So the biology isn't actually using these elements. It's just sort of the, these elements are passively sticking on to the biological particles and kind of hitching a ride. So the biological processes just have a huge impact on the chemistry of the oceans through this um, scavenging process. And some of them are incorporated uh, into the biological material to different extents, but it's not because the biology is actually actively using it. So we see a lot of elements show these kind of nutrient-like profiles, even if they're not actually nutrients uh, are being used actively by the biology. So, okay, so I wanted to come back to the, um, the one-box model. So this was our, um, so we, before we were assuming steady state and that everything was, um, the elements concentrations in the oceans weren't changing. Uh, but I just want to step back and say, well, what if they, the element concentrations do change? Um, this is the, the sort of time, de time dependent solution or equation describing um, how an element's concentration in the ocean will evolve in time if we don't assume steady state. Um, so this is basically this, the, the previous equation, but now I'm, I haven't set the left hand side to zero. Um, so this is what it looks like. And if we, um, if we solve this equation, which I won't do here, we can work out how a system will return to equilibrium after a perturbation. So basically the, um, the final, the concentration at any time is going to be equal to the 
the final equilibrium concentration plus this um, term sort of defining the time scale um, at which it's going to return to equilibrium. And you can see that it's um, sort of an exponential function of the um, removal rate constant. And so this is reflecting what I was saying before, that the ones with really long removal rate constants take a long time to come back to equilibrium. So I'll just take a little break here to solve um, one of the problems in the book. And so I want you guys to just have a chat with your neighbors about um, this problem, and then we'll um, come back and look at it. The problem is to describe what would happen in the one box model if the concentration of phosphate in the ocean um, was suddenly double, but the, but the river input and removal rate constant remain the same. So um, just describe the final steady state and then the time it would take to achieve the final steady state. Sorry, I think, um, I'm not actually sure if that's the right, I think it's supposed to say, um, it's kind of, I think it's supposed to say, just, uh, describe what would happen if the concentration of phosphate in the river water was suddenly doubled. That would make sense. The, an the answer is actually that the phosphate concentration in the ocean is going to double. <laughs> so sorry, it was not written very well. Um, it's basically giving you the answer right there. So the question was supposed to be, what to so what if you suddenly double the phosphate concentration in river water? What will happen to the ocean phosphate concentration? So I've just told you the answer. But <laughs> um, so, which is quite obvious. Uh, yeah. So if we if we double the um, if we double this the river concentration, um, then the, the ocean concentration is going to double. And um, then the question is, how long is that going to take? And that's, so that's, does anyone have an, any idea how long that's going to take to happen? Based on, <laughs> should have a look. So let's have a look at the phosphate concentrations in, in river water. It's two micromolar. And its resonance time is about 53,000 years. So, um, yeah, so it's going to be some, um, it's going to approach an equilibrium uh, at this, this 53,000 year time scale. And I just made a plot of that over here. So basically, uh, since we start out at two micromolar phosphate in the, in the ocean, we double, suddenly double the river concentration. So it actually takes quite a while for the ocean to, because of the long residence time of phosphorus in the ocean, it takes, um, well, it takes about, 50,000 years to kind of get to half the new equilibrium. And then, you know, it takes almost several hundred, several hundred, almost 300,000 years um, before it reaches the new equilibrium. So that's for phosphate. So if you suddenly double the um, amount of phosphate in the rivers, it's not like you can instantaneously change the ocean phosphate. It comes to the new equilibrium um, uh, basically um, at a rate at a rate that you can describe based on its resonance time in the ocean, which is 53,000 years. So this will be different. So an element like iron, um, well, iron is not a good example because rivers are not a really important um, source of iron, but elements that have a shorter resonance time will respond more quickly to a change in their input rate or an out their output rate. Um, Okay, so just to summarize this bit here. So basically the um, chemical composition of the ocean is representing a balance between what's coming in and what's going out. And that's different for different elements. Um, most, I said mostly they're coming in from rivers. Um, does anyone have any other, we mentioned dust, any other ideas of sources of elements in the ocean? Volcanoes, <laughs> yes. 
guy is running kind of like vents, hot springs. Yeah, uh, hydrothermal vents. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so those are some um, sources of elements to the ocean. Rivers are really the dominant one, but some elements have um, important sources from hydrothermal circulation and um, dust and so on. Um, so we haven't talked, I did mention some removal mechanisms. Um, can anyone name any removal mechanisms? Like what's, what, what are these R terms here? Yeah, the biology is a big one. Um, so just sticking onto those particles or being in the particles and then sinking out um, and going into the sediments through the biology is, is a really important removal term for a lot of the elements. I know of underground water. Sorry? Mm. Underground water, um, water entering into the land, to the underground. Oh, like... Um, uh, groundwater could no. have been. Um, that could, could be, that's mo more actually a source of elements to the ocean. Um, there is something called reverse weathering where the, um, at the seafloor, kind of the um, weathering reactions happen backwards and you, you can get um, some elements being removed that way, kind of at the seafloor. Um, Anyone know what the removal mechanisms for some of the major salts like sodium and chloride is? Uh, salt coming. Um, that's a small term. Yeah, like sea spray. Um, so. <laughs> uh, well, no, but that's um, <laughs> that actually is. So humans remove salt by evaporating, like we have these evaporated ponds, and um, we remove, yeah, we harvest the salt. So actually, on geological scales, that act is the um, humans aren't doing it, but that is how the salts are removed. So if you think of um, like the Red Sea or the, well, the Mediterranean Sea, which is kind of almost closed. If you imagine that was closed off, um, you can get very high if those basins are at. Um, High lat uh, low latitudes where it's really hot, you can get massive amounts of ev evaporation, and those um, basins can get cut off from the rest of the ocean, and basically all the water will evaporate and the salts precipitate. So in the Dead Sea, like that's happening now, um, and throughout geological history, we see these evaporative basins where massive amounts of salt um, basically precipitated out, and so that's the main way that these these salts are removed. It's just they, the certain ocean basin gets cut off from the rest of the ocean and all the water evaporates, leaving behind the salt. That, that removes water as well, so does that actually affect the <coughs> next concentration of what you still call the ocean after that? Um, well, there, it does remove water, but like the Mediterranean is not a... Um, well, it's, that, it's just a particular... It's a cut off from the ocean, so it's, yeah. um, it's not actually... The yeah, yeah, the water would go back to the ocean, just not there. Right. Yeah. And there's a um, there's kind of a well-defined sequence of different minerals that get precipitated when you evaporate the seawater. So a lot of um, like halite and gypsum, a lot of minerals that we're quite familiar with are precipitated in these basins, and that's actually the main way that those salts are removed from the ocean. Um, okay, so that's that's that. Okay, so Pete showed um, yeah, Pete showed this yesterday. Um, this is just Coming back to biology now, because that's um, what this unit is all about, <laughs> um, the biogeochemistry. So, yeah, we've got our dissolved nutrients here. We have phytoplankton removing the dissolved nutrients, making organic matter and oxygen. And then there's this sinking um, out of the surface waters. And then in the deep water, where there's no more sunlight, um, the organic matter and oxygen is used by bacteria and zooplankton, and they transform them back into dissolved carbon um, dioxide and nutrients. And then we have this uh, physics term that sort of mixes that back up into the surface water. So that's basically what's happening in terms of the biological uh, biogeochemistry in the oceans. <laughs> um, and that, like I mentioned before, has a big impact on um, the biological, the biologically used nutrients, like the, um, elements like the nutrients, and also on this host of other elements in the oceans that are not actually using the biology. Um, and I just wanted to mention this because we'll talk about it in the lab. Um, but yeah, so here's phosphate and nitrogen. 
I showed before these profiles where they are low in the surface waters and then increase in um, the deep waters. Um, and another thing you notice if you look at across different parts of the ocean is that you see variations, particularly in the deep water concentrations. Most of the ocean, the surface waters um, have very similar nutrient concentrations. In many parts of the oceans, the nutrients are just completely removed by the biology, so you have you know, zero um, nutrient in surface waters. Um, then we see big contrasts, particularly if we look um, between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, particularly in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific. Does anyone um, know why in the North Pacific we always see higher nutrient concentrations in the deep water? No. <laughs> um, not really. <laughs> it has to do with, oh, Tom. <laughs> yes, yes, it's older. So it has to do with the circulation, the large scale circulation of the ocean, um, which we actually haven't talked about at all. <laughs> so I'll just, um, yeah, well, I have a slide on this. Well, I did show that. Oh, you just. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you should have remembered from yesterday. <laughs> um, yeah, so in the, like Tom said, the, the deep Pacific is much older than the deep Atlantic. The, the waters in the deep Pacific are basically older than the waters in the deep Atlantic. And what we mean by old is that it's been longer since they were surface waters. So the sort of what we call the thermal haline circulation in the ocean, kind of the really large scale um, circulation in the ocean looks a bit like this. <laughs> Um, where, where you see X's, that's where um, cold um, surface waters at, uh, at high latitudes, these waters are very cold um, and salty, they actually become more dense, um, they become quite dense and they sink to great depth and form what we call bottom waters. Um, so that's happening here in the North Atlantic and also here in the, the Southern Ocean. And you notice in the North Pacific there's no X's. So the North Pacific is just too um, fresh. There's, um, the, the water is too fresh, so it actually doesn't get dense enough there to form these deep waters. So basically, these these surface waters um, are sinking to great depths, and then they flow along this pathway, okay. like this. And so this is sort of the deep water, and then at some point, through some physics magic, they get transformed <laughs> into back into surface waters, rising up and then returning back over here and kind of closing the loop. But the important point is that there's no deep water being formed in the North Pacific. Um, and so whenever you see these, the, where these X's are, that's where surface waters are being transformed into deep waters. So the deep waters over here in the North Atlantic were quite recently at the surface, so they kind of look like surface waters. They've had all their nutrients removed by the biology. So they're deep water, but they're kind of surface-like because they're, they were recently surface waters. So they were... <laughs> They're younger and they're more recently at the surface, so they look like surface waters. As the water flows along here, and um, all that's there's no new um, surface water being injected. All that's happening is the remains of the, of the phytoplankton are being remineralized and kind of returned back to that seawater. So they're just accumulating waste products. It's like they've been sitting in that compost bin for a really long time, <laughs> Accu accumulating all these waste products and getting um, higher and higher nutrients higher and higher CO2. And by the time you get up to the North Atlantic, uh, the North Pacific, uh, they're looking quite old with lots of remineralized nutrients. And so you see really big contrasts in the chemistry and the deep ocean between areas that have not recently had surface waters injected into them and areas that have recently had surface waters injected into them. So it's um, sort of more of a three-dimensional process than just this 2D and we'll see that it's not just the nutrients, it extends to carbon and, and oxygen as well. A lot of, um, a lot of ocean chemistry is affected by this pathway. That probably just remind me of that. All right, so um, let's check the time. Um, all right, so yeah, Pete mentioned this, so I won't talk about it before uh, too much, but yeah. Um, talked about this equation for um, organic matter production um, relating, so taking up carbon um, nutrients and turning it into these um, carbohydrates and oxygen. And it, he'd also mentioned this ratio of the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus that's produced, that's called 
sometimes called the red field ratio. And I just want to draw your attention here to this 150. So when um, phytoplankton um, fix organic matter, or fix carbon, and produce organic matter, they also release oxygen. And um, so they, they're basically releasing about 150 moles of oxygen for every mole of carbon that's fixed. So that, that's the number we're going to look at in a second. Okay, so now we're going to um, look at another box model. So now we're up to two boxes. <laughs> um, and here we're looking at a slightly different um, boxes. So before we were looking at elements coming in from the outside and, and how they affected the mean ocean concentrations of elements. Now we're just looking at sort of the internal reorganization in terms of the, the biological processes. So here we've just got, um, so we're not looking at the nutrients coming in or the removal terms, we're just looking at the reorganization within the ocean boxes. Um, so here we've got two, just two boxes, a surface box where all the biology is produced, and then uh, a deep ocean box. And we also have some um, mixing that's mixing um, water between the surface and the deep box. So that's this D term here. And this squiggly line is meant to show um, the organic matter production, so the phytoplankton converting nutrients into um, uh, phytoplankton, basically, and then they're sinking out of the surface box into the deep box. Um, and we're going to be looking at, in, in the lab this afternoon, we'll do this as well in our three box model, we're going to be using um, phosphorus as our currency, and Pete mentioned yesterday um, how often, um, well we could use nitrogen, but it's more complicated because it has messy nitrogen fixation and denitrification and so on. So phosphorus is just a bit simpler. So we'll kind of use that as our biological currency, unlike yesterday where we were using nitrate, now we're just going to use phosphorus. Um, so here where you've got C and D, just think of those as, um, what well, the element we're interested in is phosphorus. So we've got phosphorus in the surface waters, that's average surface phosphate. And we have phosph phosphorus in the deep ocean, that's the average deep phosphate. And here we have um, the exchange rate, so that's how, it, how much deep water is exchanging with the surface water. And here we have our organic matter flux, so that's a, a rate for moles per second. This is also a rate. These are just concentrations. So what we want to do is let's think about the phosphate balance for the deep box. And we'll assume that the system is in steady state so that the phosphate concentration in the both boxes is not changing. So that's we we'll set the left-hand side to zero. So if it's in steady state, that means the rate of input of phosphorus to the bottom box and the rate of um, loss has got to be equal. So um, the rate of input to so all the arrows going into the deep box, those are going to be positive terms, and all the arrows going out of the deep box are going to be um, negative terms. So down here we've got um, this first term is saying that phosphate is coming into the box, the deep box, because of phosphate in the surface waters being um, transported into the deep ocean with this mixing term. So that is just equal to the, the rate of mixing times the phosphate concentration in the surface box. Does everybody see that? So it's just whatever's in here multiplied by this water transport term is giving you that, that, is that positive number there. And then on the other hand, we've got um, the arrow going up. So the phosphate concentrations in the deep water times the volumetric exchange rate. That's telling you how much phosphate is being lost in the mixing process. And then um, this term is, in, in, when we're looking at the deep box, the organic remineralization is basically a positive term. So we're getting all the phosphate that was raining down um, through organic production is getting remineralized in the deep box. So that's a source of phosphorus to the deep box. So there's a positive term. So hopefully everyone sees that. In the lab this afternoon, you'll be writing out some equations like this. So, but it's basically exactly like this. <laughs> so have a look at that. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Yeah. Okay. So similar to what we saw yesterday, actually. Um, okay, so now what we want to do is, what we're interested in is working out what is this number, how much organic, organic matter is produced in the ocean. And we can work it out for the ocean just based on the average phosphate concentrations that we actually observe in the ocean. We can then compare that to um, other measures of organic matter production. So this is just the equation from the previous slide. And just re rearrange it slightly so that the V term is over here. And then we'll just move the organic production term to the other side here. So now we have organic production as a function of 
exchange rate times this ratio between the phosphate in the deep ocean and the phosphate in the surface waters. So the deep ocean has a phosphate concentration of about 2. And surface waters, if we're just looking at like the total surface ocean, average phosphate concentration, let's say, is pretty much 0. So the biology is pretty much completely removing phosphate from surface waters. So that's nice. We just have B times 2.1. But what is B? <laughs> Still not very useful. So we can use, you can read about this in the textbook, but basically we can use um, differences in uh, radiocarbon, so C14, between the surface ocean and the deep ocean. Um, because radiocarbon has this decay rate, um, that, a decay constant that we know, you can, as you can read about it in panel 1.2.1, but you can use that uh, difference in this sort of uh, natural clock to estimate the exchange rate, the average exchange rate. So just believe me that it ends up being um, about 1.2 times 10 to the 15 cubic meters per year, and 38 spare drops. So if we just plug that in here, we end up with this big number of um, moles of phosphorus per year. So that's the number of moles of phosphorus in the entire ocean that are being produced in surface waters and raining into the deep sea. So we can convert that number to um, units of carbon using the Redfield ratio, which is just tells us how much carbon is in, um, how much the composition of the phytoplankton in terms of their average carbon to phosphorus ratios. So it's a scale of carbon. Then we can convert that into grams of carbon using the molecular weight of carbon, which is 3.2 pentagrams of carbon per year. Uh, which in the textbook, they say the more sophisticated models give us 10 pentagrams of carbon per year. But actually, Pete said yesterday it was more like 50. So I'm thinking this number is actually not that good. But <laughs> no, it's not. It's that <laughs> Is that carbon fixation or carbon export? Carbon export. The, the fixation uh, <coughs> is, is 50. Uh, oh, okay. No, but no, the, so the, the export should be less. Okay, so maybe 10 is, anyway, it's, it's, I'd say it's, it seems to be about within an order of magnitude correct, which is um, kind of reassuring <laughs> considering how simple this model was. Um, so it's a reasonable number, and it was just like a very simple two-box model that we've just basically used the observed phosphate concentrations in the surface and deep ocean to give us some idea of how much um, organic matter is actually being produced every year and raining out of this, um, being exported into the deep sea. Um, just quickly go on here. To, so next, um, we we'll can apply the same... Um, <coughs> model to oxygen in the ocean. So I haven't talked about oxygen yet, except for briefly to say that it's produced by photosynthesis. Of course, it's also removed through respiration. And the distribution of oxygen in the ocean, um, its profile looks uh, kind of like a mirror image of um, the nutrients, where it tends to be um, high in surface waters and then gets removed in um, the deeper waters and it's sort of lower in the deep waters. And also tends to be lower in the Pacific than the Atlantic because Again, because it, the Pacific waters are older than the Atlantic waters. So if we just use the same equations for oxygen, um, we basically get the same equation as for phosphorus, um, except now we have a, an oxygen flux term. And um, yeah, so the oxygen we flux, we can relate to the phosphorus flux just using that ratio, sort of the Redfield ratio that I showed before. And then if we assume steady state again and substitute in uh, what we have what we derived the phosphate flux in the previous slide. We get this expression for the, um, the oxygen equation. And then we can rearrange that to calculate the oxygen concentration in the deep box, which actually ends up giving you a negative number, which is obviously not very um, realistic. So it's clear that although the two-box model gave quite a reasonable number for um, the organic matter production, it's giving completely unre unrealistic answers for the deep oxygen concentration. So that's where um, we bring in this three box model, which is what we'll look at uh, much more detail this afternoon. But basically, the three box model is one step more complicated. Right now, instead of just having one box at the surface, we've got two boxes at the surface. And they have different properties. And one box is at the high latitudes, and the other box is the low latitudes. So these would be like the polar oceans. Um, and the main, um, and then we've still got a deep box. The main difference here is that we can have differences between the um, 
the um, properties of the two surface boxes. So the high latitude boxes will be uh, much colder. And um, we can also say that the, um, well, one thing that we see in the high latitudes uh, today is that they have very high nutrient concentrations. So the nutrients actually don't get completely removed in the high latitudes. I think Pete showed the graph yesterday of nitrate concentrations. And um, they were very high in the Southern Ocean. So the nutrients actually aren't completely stripped out in the, the high latitudes. Another thing is that the high latitudes, um, because of um, the ocean circulation, the high latitudes, and because they have kind of the same density as the deep waters, they essentially um, communicate much more directly with deep waters. So the high latitudes are part, we'd say the deep waters are outcropping in the high latitudes. So basically, the high latitudes surface box is uh, very heavily influenced by the deep sea. We could say there's kind of like a window to the deep sea in the, in the high latitudes. It's, there's a lot of exchange happening between the surface ocean and the deep ocean in the high latitudes. That's what's represented here. And then this T term is sort of a one-way transport. It's supposed to be showing um, that pathway of deep ocean circulation that I showed before, where you have sinking in the deep ocean, uh, sinking at the high latitudes, <coughs> and then upwelling into the low latitudes. So this would be kind of what we call the, um, uh, the overturning circulation. So this model is slightly more um, realistic. And um, yeah, so here's a few properties. We have in the, the high latitude box, the, um, because of iron limitation, we have the phosphate concentration is actually not zero. There's sort of nutrient limitation other than nutrients. So we have some nutrients in the surface waters. Also, um, oxygen, like all gases, is more soluble in cold water. And now we're going to say that this high latitude box is actually colder than the low latitude. So we can have more oxygen in that box because of the colder temperatures. And basically, if we account for these two differences, we can get a much more realistic oxygen concentration in the deep ocean. So here, if we, here's the equation again. If we plug in these new values, oh, sorry, this is the new equation using the, um, the, the three box model. So if we plug in these values, so now we have higher oxygen concentrations in the surface box because it's colder. Um, and then we also have higher nutrients in the surface box of the high latitudes because it's iron limited and it, biology is not completely removing the phosphate. Then we end up with at least a positive oxygen concentration in the deep sea, which is um, relatively close to the actual deep ocean oxygen concentration. So, um, so once we add in these slightly more realistic features of the ocean, we can get a slightly more, well, a, a lot more realistic estimate of the deep ocean oxygen. And these, these features are definitely um, they're not just made up. These are definitely features of the real ocean that reflect what's actually happening. They're important to include to get the deep ocean oxygen correct. OK, so I'll just summarize here, and then we'll have a little break. Um, so basically, the ocean chemical composition re represents this balance between the rate of what's coming in and the rate of output. Um, and we can kind of summarize the reactivity of elements in the ocean by this concept of the resonance time which uh, is the ratio of the average um, amount of an element in the ocean divided by its rate of input or output, and sort of the average time spent by an element in the ocean between coming in from rivers and being lost. And uh, we can actually learn quite a bit about, or quantify quite a bit about ocean biogeochemical processes using really simple box models. Um, the one thing we've seen is the excess of nutrients in the high latitudes is, and, and just the fact that the high latitude ocean communicates much more directly with the deep sea, it's a really important feature that you need to capture to kind of accurately describe the distribution of these, a lot of these elements in the oceans. Um, and then once we incorporate those into a, a three box model, we get a pretty realistic um, estimate of the deep ocean oxygen concentration. And in the lab this afternoon, you'll get to play with the three box model and see just play around with it. You can look at oxygen and, and other um, aspects of the circulation and ocean chemistry. <laughs> so we'll have a break now and um, yeah, move on to the next lecture. I think like 10 minutes? How long? <laughs> yeah, 10 minutes. Come back in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs>